All right, so this is switching up the stack, transitioning MSP critical applications. My name is Ryan Southwell. Um, for reasons that are going to become clear as the presentation goes on, I am not a professional speaker. However, I am an MSP Geek member that's been in the MSP space for about 10 years in IT for about 20. And uh, you can see me bloviating on the MSP Geek Slack. Um, I used to be known as the Smoking Klingon. Um, decided to go a little bit less Jim Cramer, a little more Jim Henson with the Smoking Hulk, but you still won't like me when I'm angry. Sometimes I don't like myself when I'm angry, so we'll try to avoid that today. Um, I also happen to be the owner and chief bottle washer of Meta MSP LLC, and I am uh, additionally the director of technical operations for iPower Technologies, an MSP based out of South Florida. Um, already made one of the unauthorized announcements, but uh, let me make another. Um, just want to call back to something from the keynote. The picture on the left is from uh, the first MSP Geek meetup that I attended. It actually was at IT Nation 2019. Um, a different conference uh, sponsored by ConnectWise and great event, but um, that was before MSP GeekCon was a reality. You can see the picture on the right which is the group photo from MSP GeekCon last year, and I'll let the, uh, the photos speak for themselves. Huge growth in the organization, huge uh, growth in turnout for physical presence and attendance, and I believe I've got a couple of the MSP Geek board members uh, in attendance. If you could stand up for just a moment. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for all that you do in keeping this organization moving forward and keeping it growing. Also would like to point out that by now you should have downloaded the Whova app uh, on your cell phone, tablet, um, Android side loading on Windows 11, um, wherever you can get it, but that gives you access to copies of all the presentations. I will make my slide deck available after today's talk, so if you'd like to peruse it, um, actually, I, I would like to point out that if you take that slide deck home and you do some Google Foo, you're going to get wealths of information that are beyond what I could possibly present to you today. And that's really the point, is to encourage you to uh, feel confident in transitioning one of your MSP's applications, give you a little bit of tidbit so that you can take this up and you can adapt it to your needs. Through that Whova app, you can also uh, chat with other attendees and participants, uh, plan your agenda, which hopefully you've done already, and provide feedback. I would like to point out, I am not a professional speaker, again, but I would like your feedback after this talk so that I know what I can improve upon if I ever get the opportunity again. Let's scope our discussion a little bit. And that's because everybody in IT knows that scope, scope creep is real. Let's keep it tight. Now, one of the things I really hope that you go home and Google is start with why. And there's a thought leader in this space. His name is Simon Sinek. Um, he's got a wealth of information on why starting with why is important. But if you start with why and you define the problem you're trying to solve, it's really going to inform a lot of your other decision making um, throughout the process. Now, I'm gonna go off of two basic assumptions. You're either here because you are planning for the day that you will need to change a critical component of your MSP's tool set, or you've already had the dubious pleasure of making that change at some point in the past. And I did put a poll up in the Whova app prior to the session, and several of you indicated that you've already been down that path. So I'm hoping that if nothing else today, you can take away some of uh, the benefits of my experiences and um, make the process more efficient the next time you have to. What this talk is not, it's not a concrete recipe for migration. That's impossible. And the reason is because every MSP is different. Every tool set is different. The way that you use those tools is not going to be the same way that another MSP in the community uses their tool set. What I can give you, however, is pointing out some of the commonalities that I've found in making many of these migrations throughout my career. 
Not a concrete, foolproof example, but still a pattern like some of you programmers out there, you talk about reusable patterns and components. The more that you follow a process, the easier it's going to become the next time you need to rely on it later. This is not going to be a course in project management, decision making, risk management, effective business communication, or systems interfacing. Although migrating an MSP critical application requires a little bit of each of those. And if you're newer in your career, you're still in school, I encourage you to seek out those courses that pertain to project management, data-driven decision making, risk analysis and management, effective business communication, because all of those skills not only pertain to migrating an MSP critical business application, but to your career overall. So a little bit about myself. I am not Goots. Goots is much more attractive. <laughs> I am, however, a, a, a multiple serial entrepreneur. And I began my IT career in 2003 with a dirty little product called Small Business Server. Um, Mendy mentioned that during the keynote. And uh, 7282, anybody? No? All right, I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> Um, that used to be the uh, Microsoft exam for a small business consultant, but in any event, in 2012 I was hired into a regional MSP in Central Ohio and tasked with implementing their RMM, which at the time was known as LabTech. Did a couple years at ConnectWise in the, uh, the Service Plus department. Actually, I see some of the audience I used to work with uh, in that very same department. Um, after transitioning away from ConnectWise, I became an independent consultant specializing in RMMs, particularly Automate. And then since 2021, I've been the Director of Technical Operations at iPower Technologies, where I successfully managed the transition of over 5,000 endpoints, a first a forced transition from Silence to Sentinel-1, and then an internal uh, decision migration from Automate to Ninja. Who are you? Ideally, you're either a business decision maker, which depending on the school of business thought you subscribe to, you could be an investor, you could be a visionary, you could be an integrator, you could be the chief bottle washer. I, I, either way, you're responsible on some level for what your MSP uses. Or you're one of those individuals that's operating daily within that stack. You could be a builder like our outgoing CEO, Kyle Spooner. You could be an incoming, I'm sorry, you could be a fixer like our incoming interim CEO, Mendy. Or you could be a doer, in which case you're being tasked with things inside that MSP stack that are going to expose you to more challenges and give you greater opportunities to hone your skill set. Now, this is going to come as something familiar to the vets in the audience. Prior planning and research prevents poor performance, and that's really what most of my talk today is going to be about, planning this transition, researching what you need to do and how to decide which direction to go in when you make the call to get away or move off of something that you use currently. Let's talk about some bad reasons to switch and some good reasons. Bad reasons to switch. One outspoken voice in your company. Well, that's an opportunity to discuss with that individual what their opinions are and why they feel that way. They may have a unique perspective compared to what you're familiar with or something, have knowledge of something that you've become blind to operating day to day. You could be unfamiliar with your existing platform, in which case the answer is education and training. You could be dealing with insufficient resources and you need to optimize the allocation within the organization, or you could be considering a switch because of peer pressure, or jumping on the bandwagon. And you know what, there's some value to crowdsourcing opinions, absolutely. In fact, some of today's business, uh, strongest business competitors utilize crowdsourcing to drive their businesses. However, when you're talking about what you use day to day, I encourage you to do your own research and form your own opinions. You could very well find that the bandwagon is right, or you could find out that their assumptions and their context is completely different than yours. In which case, 
their opinions won't apply. The context won't match. Price is never a good reason to switch. And I'll get to that in a moment. So good reasons to switch. Maybe it's a forced or an upstream change. That's something that I dealt with soon after becoming a director of tech ops at the MSP. Our security operations vendor told us, hey, guess what, guys? We know that you've been using Silence through us for so long, but we're moving to Sentinel-1. In that case, you don't have a choice. You have to go along with it, or you have to change vendors or change uh, environments overall. It could be customer demand. Maybe you're a, a Windows-only shop, but you're signing clients that have Macs that you need to support. Now all of a sudden, okay, well, am I going to play ball with Apple Business Manager, or what am I going to do? You know, you can't necessarily use a Windows tool on a Mac. You might be consolidating your tool sets. You might have decided that you simply have too many agents deployed, the overhead and the administrative burden is too high, and you were combining single-purpose applications into a multi-purpose product that can fulfill multiple needs. In the keynote, Kyle brought up iterations of change and modernization. Maybe you're finding that the platform you've used up until this point just isn't meeting the needs that you're, you're foreseeing in your business currently. You may have irreconcilable differences with the vendor. Maybe something has changed with their ownership structure or their strategy or their long-term plans and the relationship that you once had no longer is appropriate for your business. I said I'd come back to price never being a, a good reason to switch. But when you reframe that and put it in context as a cost-benefit advantage, then it can become a very good reason to switch. The idea, though, is never look at price alone as a determinant. Always weigh that out with the value that you're getting for that price. Oftentimes, some of the most expensive products in a space are the most tuned and purpose-built that are available. However, you may be willing to make certain concessions because you may not need a service now or a NetSuite with a custom developer attached to it to run your business. In that case, it's not appropriate. Why would you spend money on something that is far beyond what your MSP needs? Always keep your decisions, not just about applications, but in business overall, in the right context. Once you've decided that you need to make a change, you have to decide between different alternatives. And this is one of the tools that I really hope that you'll take away from this lesson, go and research a little more, and adapt to your own uh, daily needs. And that's something called the RACI matrix. I didn't come up with this. I'm not that smart, but I did find a couple of uh, useful tools on Google, including this wonderful uh, chart from Team Gantt. So what RACI is, is a way of categorizing the different roles that a stakeholder has with a system, with a process. And I'll let you read for yourself, of course, but R is for somebody that's responsible for this particular system or this particular change. Normally, they're the ones that do the work to complete the task. You need at least one of those or nothing's going to get done. <laughs> There's going to be somebody who's accountable for the change, for the decision. Typically, this is going to be the approver. Oftentimes, the person that is responsible for doing the work reports to the person that's accountable or approves the end results of, those work, uh, of that work. You want, ideally, only one approver per task or per decision or per migration, sometimes that's not feasible. Sometimes you have to stand accountable to a board or to an executive committee. But ideally, there's one person to say, does this meet your specifications? C is for consulted. I've also seen it as contributor. These are the folks that will intimately use the system, will have expert opinions upon what is working today, what needs to work in the future, what they'd like to see. For an RMM system, that's typically going to be your service delivery staff and your engineers. And then last but not least is I for informed. These are the folks that 
aren't going to be intimately involved in the process of change or using the system, but are in some way going to be affected by the results of your migration, your decision to change, and so on. This could be your help desk staff. This could be your end users. It all needs to be analyzed in the context of the decision of the application that you're trying to uh, migrate. Here's another little tool that I often refer back to, which is uh, this graph. And this calls back to the keynote as well of talking about prioritization being the uh, summation of impact, which is on the y-axis here, versus urgency, which is on the x-axis. And this graph can inform you as to what decision-making style is most appropriate for the decision that you're trying to make, the migration that you're trying to perform. If you have a lot of time to make the decision, then you can take a democratic or a consensus approach. And let's talk about these uh, different decision-making styles for a moment. Autocratic decision-making is when one person makes the decision without consulting um, other people, without consulting external sources, it's top-down. Now, that's great for day-to-day, low-impact, low-urgency decisions, and sometimes in a high-urgency situation, like a disaster recovery scenario, it might have to be an autocratic decision. There might not be time to get all your engineers in and say, okay, what do we do about this guy that's exfiltrating this data? You know what, pull the network connection and then figure out. But the point is, is that there are circumstances where an autocratic decision style is most appropriate. If you have, um, I'm sorry, if the decision is urgent but it is very impactful, that's where you're going to start pulling in the stakeholders that have the uh, intimate knowledge of the application you're trying to migrate. I would hate to have to weigh a decision of migrating from VMware over to Proxmox if the only thing I knew were the names of those tools. You know, um, I would absolutely, even though I'm aware of their existence in the marketplace, I would need to rely on somebody that operates that virtualization infrastructure day to day in order to make an informed decision about if this was a good plan moving forward and how to implement that plan. Stepping back to the left side of the graph, consensus and democratic decision styles. Democratic is for those low impact, low urgency things where you can inform the people that are involved in the decision and then wait for them to vote. And well, if elections are any indication, that has a tendency to take a little bit of time. Sometimes you just don't have that time. Guess what, if you don't have the time for a democratic decision-making approach, you don't have the time to build consensus and get everybody to agree to something. However, if you do have the luxury of time to use a consensus approach, then guess what? You have everybody's buy-in from square one because everybody agreed that it was a good idea to move forward. Once you've des uh, decided on the path, you need to communicate that. Another thing that was mentioned yesterday uh, during the keynote, communication. And just to call something out, in space, nobody can hear you. I, I could, or, am I in space? Come on, guys, one more time. In space, nobody can hear you. Thank you. So, don't operate in a vacuum. If you operate in a vacuum, nobody else around you knows what's going on. You're limiting yourself from the benefit of somebody else's experience if you never open the dialogue to them and say, hey, what is your knowledge of this? This is what we're doing. Can you add something? If you operate in a vacuum, guess what, when things go wrong, nobody can hear you scream then either because you didn't tell anybody you were doing it. So, always, at every level of the process, communicate what's been done, what's going to happen, and solicit feedback for those things that have been done. We talked about the RACI matrix before. Guess what, you can use that again. 
Because those same roles that you assigned when you were deciding who to involve in the decision-making process can now inform you of who and how you communicate the process of change. As a consultant, I was the person responsible for doing the work directly. The person or organization that I was accountable to was my client. I would consult the MSP staff for their opinions and their day-to-day -day experiences using the platform that we were migrating, and I would inform leadership of what was going on at all points throughout the process. When I had to manage a forced migration because of a vendor transition, the person responsible for doing that transition was partially the vendor for making that decision in their business to use a different platform, but of course it was incumbent upon our managed services technicians to deploy the agent, uninstall the old software, etc. I was accountable as the director of that, but I also consulted not just with the vendor, and I'm gonna bring that back uh, a couple slides later because that's very important, and also the cybersecurity speed that we had in-house. People that I informed during that transition and afterwards were the service delivery folks so that they knew, hey, we moved from Silence to Sentinel-1. There might be some tickets that come in for incompatibilities. Expect it. Let us know so that we can adapt this new system that we put in place to our, our uh, current client's business needs. When I transitioned our internal RMM from Automate to Ninja, the entire managed services department was responsible for doing the work. Again, it was my neck on the line. <laughs> And I consulted with everybody that used the RMM platform, and that turned out to be very integral to the process. I'll get to that in a moment. Informing the results of that process, of course, was with service delivery, but also to the end users, because guess what happens to uh, Bob in accounting at your physician's practice that you support when they see an icon change from one to a different icon? They're on the phone saying, hey, something's going on with my computer, what'd you change? Well, if you informed your end users that you were about to make a change, you informed them when that change was going to happen, and then you followed up with them after that change was complete, you're going to avoid that call, and you're also going to generate a feeling of goodwill and engagement with your customer. Let's talk about execution. In other words, YOLO. <laughs> and I, I, when I was tweaking this presentation, um, I was thinking about the keynote when uh, Mendy talked about asking new, uh, new participants in the MSP Geek community about how they applied solution center updates in lab tech. And that really was a uh, very risky process, but one that couldn't be ignored. And oftentimes it was the YOLO approach. We're going to press the button, we're going to... Exactly. Can, can we see that one more time? <laughs> exactly. Now. As part of managing risk, though, you try to eliminate as many uncertainties in the decision-making and implementation processes as you can. That's the balance. You can take a high amount of risk if there is no way to get more information about what you're doing. If you have more information available, do you have the time to gather and analyze that information? If so, use it because then you're going to eliminate yet another variable from the equation, and that's going to ensure your results even further. Since we're in Orlando, very close to Walt Disney World, I wanted to throw a quote in there from Walt Disney himself. The way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. Well, that might seem a little bit oxymoronic considering this is a talk, but you know this is part of the research and planning stage, right? But let's talk about how that timeline goes from the point of decision to the point of deployment and rollout. And when I was modeling this timeline, I heavily relied upon my transition from Automate to Ninja RMM. We decided that we needed to make a change. There were certain things that Automate wasn't doing that were critical to our business processes, and it actually caused an issue with one of our anchor clients. And it was at that point that my president said, Lick, we, we, we've got to find something better. You know, it's worked up till this point, but 
we can't uh, afford to have this same incident happen again. And that started the process of due diligence where I compiled a short list of the alternatives that were available in the market and that were applicable to our MSP. Now I told you I was going to go back to um, uh, vendor support and vendor relationships later in the presentation. Once I had that short list, I started turning the vendors on, using their own sales tactics on themselves. I started blowing up their phone. I started telling them, look, you guys have got those pre-sales engineers. I want them to meet my engineers and they can have an engineer off, all right? You know, all joking aside, that turned out to be very critical because by putting the internal stakeholders in direct communication with those pre-sales engineers from the vendors, it became very clear that while two out of the three vendors and, and solutions that I had on my short list looked great on paper, looked great on, on the spec sheet, checked all the boxes, when my engineers started communicating with them, hey, we have this unique use case here. Okay, well, what about when we need to adapt something here? And a couple of the vendors fell very short. They couldn't answer questions about their own product. Well, if they can't answer own questions about, uh, I'm sorry, questions about their own product before you've signed on the line, what's gonna happen afterwards? You know, so just something to think about. Use the resources that the vendors provide for you. They're paying the bill for, for their salaries. All you have to invest is the time. And it was that particular um, interaction that my team had with Ninja that really made us feel confident about the transition to them as a platform. They were willing to spend what ended up being two months of weekly meetings with my engineering staff, going through their product, going through the edge cases, the corner cases, and making sure, yes, we have an answer for everything. Once you have signed on the line, contracts are signed, training starts. And that's a very important thing because it's great if you decided on the right product, but what happens when you get to day one, you roll it out, and the rest of your staff that wasn't involved in the process go, well, what, what's this? We've never seen this before. You have to take that lead up to train your staff so that they are at least passingly effective with it from day one. There's no way to be 100% effective with anything until you've used it in, prog in uh, production. That's true. But training can eliminate a lot of that lag and make sure that you get started on the right foot. With much apologies to South Park, uh, the rollout phase is when you actually do the needful and you profit. And yes, I'm bringing the underpants gnomes, if anybody remembers that episode from way back. But the reality is, is that at this point, you've involved your internal stakeholders, you've decided on a solution, you have access to the documentation, you have access to the vendor. At this point, you need to trust your team to do what they do. You have a purpose hired scripting engineer that will power shell their way out of a paper bag with one hand tied behind their back and hung over from a conference, okay? <laughs> um, the point of it is, is that by this point, you should be able to rely on the staff that you've hired to do their jobs that they've been hired to do with the resources that you've acquired and put in front of them. However, it's not enough to research something and plan it appropriately if you don't also check your results and act upon them. And a couple of acronyms for the academics in here, total quality management, continuous quality improvement, plan, do, check, anyone, act, no? Okay, Google those because those are business processes that you should be applying not, again, to transitioning an application, but to every business decision that you make. Plan what you're doing, do it, check the results, and then act on the information that you get. Operational considerations for migrating an RMM. Definitely gonna leave this slide up here. I hope that uh, some of you refer to this when you download the slide deck later. But an RMM is a particularly important part 
of the MSP stack. And um, through the process, we had to define, well, what devices get enrolled into that RMM? What configurations get deployed and how? What software is deployed and how are we going to determine what devices get a particular piece of software? Moving into service delivery, again, training before day one, so that when we do cut over to that system, help desk can use it effectively and respond to tickets without being flat-footed. Porting of customizations, integration with PSA, defining those inputs and outputs, garbage in and garbage out, folks. If you don't take into account the interconnections that that system has with other systems in your business, you might have a bulletproof RMM, but what good is it if your previous RMM was populating quantities into your billing agreements and you migrate to the system and now those counts are static? Those things have to be identified and documented. And <laughs> get to that in the next slide also, but documentation is key here. From an administ administrative aspect, if you can, test billing before day one. Guess what problem we had when we migrated from our, uh, Automate to Ninja? It turns out that um, numbers were getting ported over, but we didn't take into account the different classes of devices. So rather than quantities of VMs, quantities of physical servers, quantities of on-site Veeam servers being populated into our manage agreement properly, well, we had a server count. Good enough, right? No. Because now all of the servers were getting populated into one line item that we had other line items broken out for different classes. So that was a mistake that we identified. And once we had that information that it was incorrect, we acted on it. We had to create those classes. We, we already identified in the pre-sales engineering portions that Ninja could support that level of granularity. Somebody who I may or may not know, just forgot to implement it. <clears throat> so, <laughs> that being said, not documented, not done. So this is critical in any type of professional service. If you're from the ConnectWise ecosystem, you have heard that as, if it's not managed, it's not done. But the concept as a general business rule is very valid, and this is where it ties back into uh, secure, defend, and recover. We'll get to that in a moment. All of these things that you've done to research this transition, to plan it out, identifying stakeholders, identifying integrations, identifying who will be affected downstream, all of that should be documented because guess what? It's going to come in handy later. Measuring your success. Um, we're actually running close to time, so I'm going to accelerate just a bit, but um, KPIs and metrics for success should be selected based on the context of the decision or the migration that you're making. As a consultant, one of my common tasks was tuning Automate so that it didn't slam the help desk with thousands of tickets a day. In that particular context, it made sense to measure the success of a tuning project based off of how many tickets were generated after versus before, how many were auto-resolved. Carrying that through to the other parts of the business, how much time did that save the business, and how much billable time was generated from having that automation uh, tweaked and tuned. When we migrated, uh, when we had a forced migration from Silence to Sentinel-1, the metrics were different. How many endpoints were fully uninstalled from Silence, fully onboarded to Sentinel-1? How many of those we're lagging out in somebody's car or somebody's um, equipment closet that we still needed to uh, track down and make sure we're migrated. Did we account for all the whitelisting and exclusions? Did all those get ported over? And then when we migrated RMM platforms, it was, again, how many endpoints were migrated from one system to the other, but also how quickly were our internal resources adopting and using this new tool? Something we found is that even though Automate prov uh, provided a script engine that was very accessible even to uh, a beginning scripter, the fact that Ninja natively supported PowerShell was a huge, huge benefit to us because even the newest members of our team already had exposure to PowerShell. And what we found is that within weeks of us transitioning to 
RM, uh, to Ninja RMM, I had to go through our developer sandbox that I, I set up and be like, wow, where did these hundreds of scripts come from? And how can these be modularized so that we can use them elsewhere rather than just the, the use case they were built for? So having the right tool for the right use case and measuring the effectiveness of that tool with the right metrics is key. And of course, if you measure something but you don't adapt what you're doing to the new information, you're not being a genius, you're being insane. Now, re realistically speaking, I just want an excuse to put Einstein sticking his tongue out in my presentation. <laughs> but the reality is, is that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. If you are doing something in this process and you have access to new information that says, wait a minute, this isn't working out. Well, if you keep barreling forward, you're just increasing your sunk costs. Now, that's not to say that you can look back at a decision in hindsight and measure the effectiveness of that decision in the context of new information. You can't. You can only measure the effectiveness of a decision in the context of the information that was available to you at the time the decision was made. Now, on the other hand, if you are presented with new information and you don't respond to it, you're doing your, yourself a disservice and you're probably gonna have to revisit it later. So how does this relate to Secure Defend Recover? Well, I originally wrote this talk for people, process, and automation, but um, the reality is, is that I was asked to modify it. Remember that documentation I was talking about? Well now, when you do your risk assessment and your hardening, you can use that RACI matrix to inform who may be part of the attack surface. Who do I need to spend time training? Where am I going to get the most effectiveness in securing this environment? You've already identified the stakeholders as part of planning a transition. Now you can use that same information to inform your security efforts. You've identified the inputs and outputs of a particular system. So now you know what systems can be vulnerable to lateral movement if that central system gets compromised. Defending that part of your MSP stack. You wanna do a red team exercise? I guarantee you that those stakeholders that were involved in the decision making process, they're gonna be great targets for some social engineering testing. They have the root access, guess what? If they have root access to your VMs, that's where the, where the bad guys are gonna try to go. They're not gonna try to infiltrate your virtualization infrastructure from you know, the guy that uses the billing platform. They might pivot, but the point of it is is that this documentation that you developed as part of your migration and decision-making process is now going to make the process of identifying, securing, and hardening your systems more efficient, and you're not going to have to redo that research. And recovering. So this is a very, very simple point. A disaster recovery scenario can be reframed as a forced migration from the compromised system into one that hopefully is pristine and non-compromised. I mean, essentially, that's what it is. You can no longer trust that old system that you were using, but now if you have all the documentation of what was linked in to where, what was into that system, what came out of that system, who needs access to it, who doesn't need access to it, well, you essentially have the specifications already documented for rebuilding that system from the ground up if you took that documentation. So always remember to document this process. It will come in use outside of the migration process. It's something that you can refer back to as part of your cybersecurity efforts and ultimately um, will save a lot of time in the long run so that you can spend it selling, automating, improving your business elsewhere. So I've just spent 40 minutes up here talking. We've got five minutes left for Q&A, so I would like to open it up to uh, the open forum at this time. Any questions?
So that's very situational, and that's, that's a very good point because um, we talk a lot about like hardware refresh cycles as MSPs, but we don't necessarily look at the tool set. And it really depends when there's something disruptive on the market. You know, um, that's actually another thing that I have pending to answer in the Whova app was how do you stay current? And you stay current by being involved in a community such as MSP Geek. Putting a question out in Slack or Discord, hey, what are you guys using for billing? What are you guys using for ticket management? Do you see something new in the backup space that you're using? Your peers in the MSP space can often inform when there is something disruptive to look at. And we, so to directly answer your question, we don't have a defined process. We look at it and look to see if there are um, disruptions or waves in the marketplace from somebody getting a lot of, not necessarily press time, but pure thought time. If other people in the same space as you are devoting time and energy to considering it, well, they're working with the same limited resources as you are. So it would probably behoove you to at least take a look and see what the buzz is about. Fair? Any other questions? So, yes, but it wasn't necessarily a result of the migration itself. It was rather adapting to the new capabilities that the tool had to offer. Um, in doing the due diligence and planning for the transition from Automate to Ninja, the main questions we asked were, can we solve for what we're solving for today? Are we going to go backwards by this transition? Now, once we were able to solve for all of the use cases and all of the current needs, it was a very simple step to say, okay, well, we've checked those boxes. Now what else is this capable of? And at that time, we did start to evaluate and adapt those processes and workflows that relied on that tool. Because that tool gave us opportunities that weren't available before. Sir. <clears throat> Two things. The wealth of knowledge that existed in people that weren't thought to be included in the process initially and I'm talking about internal staff that may or may not have used a portion of the RMM platform day to day, but for whatever reason, be it they were an enthusiast with a home lab, they had a wealth of information that wasn't being tapped in their job role, but they still had access to, and they were willing to share just for the asking. The other thing was the wide spread spectrum with which vendors were willing to support their own sales processes. And that was very, very eye-opening because, in, and I'll keep this very generalized, in working with some vendors, their sales reps and, and, and engineers almost had the attitude of, well, if you're talking to us, you know we're the best in the business. We don't, need, we don't need to spend any time letting you know what we're capable of because, well, you need us, we don't need you. Well, if you need me, why aren't you paying me money to use your product? You know? So that was the low end of the spectrum, but then at the other end of the spectrum, there were the vendors that were willing to go out of their way to support the process and even be so forthcoming as to say, hey, you know what? You've identified a gap in our product. We don't have an answer for it right now. However, that's something that we'll get to with product management and see if it's feasible. And the difference in vendor engagement was striking. Now, I will say that as a whole, I prefer to work with vendors that 
are collaborative in their approach rather than competitive or uh, in some cases looking to cut you out of the channel entirely. That was a, uh, definitely a wake-up call. Any other questions, sir? Mm -hmm. Awesome, I really appreciate that feedback, thank you. All right, guys, um, this is very close to the time, so um, any last burning questions, desires, thoughts? All right, not seeing any. Something I've uh, waited 20 years of my career to say, thank you for coming, not to my TED Talk, but to something even better. Thank you for coming to my MSP GeekCon Talk. <laughs>